Hello and welcome back. Sean here, Mountains Garage in the beautiful state of Maine. Mid 70s, low humidity, loving life right now. Today we're going to go completely off my normal path. I do that on occasion if you follow along, which I hope you do. I haven't asked anybody to subscribe in quite a while, but I sure wish more people would because we're closing in on 5,000 subscribers. And the more the merrier. I'd like to go, you know, 50 to 100,000 someday, but at the rate I'm going, I'll be 110. <laughs> Maybe it's my diverse content. Because today, if you read the thumbnail that I haven't even made yet, we're going to talk about motorcycles. Let's start briefly, I hope, with my riding history, or well, specifically the bikes that I rode. When I was a kid, my mother in her 70 Pontiac Bonneville 455, we'd go yard sailing into flea markets. And one day I talked her into buying a $15 Montgomery Ward mini bike. No suspension, five horse Tecumseh that didn't run, centrifugal clutch, and the rear brake was the only brake it had. Just a metal plate that rubbed on the tire when you stepped down with your right foot. It didn't run my big brother, like a good big brother, volunteered to rebuild the engine, which he did. I don't know where he even got the time to do it, but he sat there down in my parents' basement for a few nights, afternoons and nights while I patiently watched. I was zero help, I'm sure, but probably by that weekend, he had built a custom exhaust, had the motor all back in and it ran. And for the first day, I wore my helmet around the yard I burned my inner thigh. You can probably still see the sky on the exhaust a few times. <laughs> uh, it'll factor later in the story, but that's also the last day I ever wore that helmet, I think, for quite a while. And I would terrorize my neighborhood with that thing. I was probably between third and fourth grade, maybe fifth grade at the time. And I rode it until I was 17. And I was at a local Ford dealer. They had a bunch of used car auction sale type thing. And there was a 1978, I believe, Kawasaki KE125 on and off-road, two-stroke motorcycle. My first street bike and off-road bike. I mean, I rode the mini bike up to that point. I registered that. I already had my driver's license and I, my motorcycle test. I must have taken on that, I guess. Yeah, I did. So I was ready to go. And I could go off-road and come out of a trail on the road, get pulled over by the police department, and brush the dirt off the plate, show them it was legal, and off I would go. Unlike my buddies on their dirt bikes would get stuck because they had a lot more travel, a lot more speed. This bike was really good at neither on or off-road. It would go 61 miles an hour downhill. And I there was one spot where they would always dump the sand from sweeping, in this old deserted lot and I could get up enough speed at full throttle fifth gear hit that jump and I could I thought I was evil Knievel I could do that over and over again and I'd go quite a ways and braver than I should have been considering I was wearing zero safety gear my next bike was a Honda CB650 that my now brother-in-law had bought and decided he wanted something else that was a nice bike but the battery was always dead I had put a Jardine four into one pipe on it because you had to do that to get that sound. Bought it from JC Whitney. I never modified the cobs. I just put it on there and ran it. And every day I'd want to go to work in the morning. There was a hill near my parents' house. I'd push it up the hill, pop the clutch on the way down. Unfortunately, right in front of the sergeant of the police department of my town, when she had back to life, it was right in front of his house. And I wasn't necessarily very popular with him. <laughs> I rode that bike on and off until one day I was happened to, every bike I bought to this point it was just by happenstance I came across it whoa scared me a box just fell down my cardboard collection I was at a motorcycle dealer and there was a who 89 or 90 no back that up 83 or 4 Suzuki GS1100, before the good ones. This was a 1100E, maybe. 
had all the power, but didn't have the handling that the regular GSs did or later years had. This was more of a straight up motorcycle with a ton of power. I redid the carbs on that in the summer of 1990, put a four into one pipe on it. That bike was dangerous. You never knew when the front end was coming up and I wore it wearing shorts, no shirt, slippers, stupid, absolutely. But I lived through it. And eventually sold that when I moved up here. I actually had it up here. I moved up to where I currently live in 1991. And I must have sold it off and I don't remember what I even did with it. But I know it was gone. And I was between bikes, which I hadn't been since my mini bike days. It would always go one bike to the next. I would improve my bike, you know, situation just by luck and then sell the other one off to hopefully pay for most of the next one. So I was messing around with four-wheel drive trucks. I had gone drag racing up at this point. It sold everything to buy my house. I didn't have a lot of money. First time homeowner. So I would, you know, work on old rusty Chevy C10s, K10s, 15s, 20, you know, 2500, 3500 trucks. I built a whole bunch of them. My whole yard became full of old trucks. As I often do, I bought a lot of material for future projects. And then one day, I was at my buddy's house and he had had for a year or so a 1986 Harley Davidson FXR. And that was expensive at the time. This was on the upswing of the Harley Davidson craze. It was the end of the 1990s. All the aftermarket bike companies showed up. Every big twin Harley. The summer I bought that FXR was at least 10,000 bucks if it came in in a basket. It was so hot. I, it isn't why I did it. I just happened over my buddy's house. He wanted to buy a different bike. I definitely did him a solid by buying that one. I could have bought all kinds of bikes for what I paid for it, but it was still a good deal. I didn't know how good I had it. And this is when my opinion and we start talking about Holly Davison's from here on out. I'd always wanted a Holly because my brother had three Hollies that I remember when I was a kid. He's 12 years older, I guess. So he was doing cool stuff when I was still a kid on my bike and I could witness the choppers that he had and he just had cool stuff. I was around that. That was my destiny in my mind, my small mind that I still have. <laughs> so the FXR, Holly Davidson, is basically a touring bike FL frame, all stripped down, with some differences, I understand, but basically it has external shocks, a rubber mount engine, it takes the same powertrain as the touring bikes. I didn't know how good I had it because I sold that to my buddy after I bought, I built from scratch a custom bike. Now all the custom bike manufacturers that popped up in the 90s and the aftermarket frames you still buy, most of those have a solid mount. Evo engine, or maybe even a twin cam, but it's bolted solid to the bike. That is okay if you're not going very far. They're mostly soft tail based or, well, let's talk about models of Harleys. You have the touring bikes, which have external shocks, even though they're hidden by the saddlebags most of the time. They are wicked comfortable. They're heavy, they handle nice. I find no flaws in that platform. The FXR was cool, but an ugly bike. I'd never like the narrow glide front end. The forks are closer together like a Sportster. It had a Sportster front end, basically. In the looks department, the FXR is a failure. Softail, definitely the coolest bike Holly ever built. They handle nice. They have, you know, 30 plus degrees of rake. The seating position is low. The gearing is good. As a starter bike, People buy Sportsters, which have a high first gear, so they stall easy. They're really high, so you barely they have people to have trouble touching the ground, and over they go. Sportster is a terrible bike in general. I mean, they're fun if you know how to ride it, but they're not easy, as easy to ride as a soft tail. So if I was a first time rider, I would have a soft tail, knowing what I know now. And the FL platform, the touring bike, is too tall for me. I'm not that tall, I'm like 5'10". I can't touch flat footed. So 
I'm going to finish my story in lines of Hollies that I bought and we get to the touring bike. So I built my custom bike with my solid mount Evo, all the aftermarket parts because you think that's the way to go. You know, this catalog's full of stuff. It's all junk. It's not going to last. That's what the aftermarket bikes are made out of. They don't last either. It's junk. If you're smart, you go to the swap meets, you buy all the factory Holly stuff that people took off their bikes and build a bike out of that stuff. Because the factory Holly stuff is all phosphorus coated, doesn't rust. Whereas the aftermarket stuff, when you buy it, it has Allen headed screws that are like chrome plated. As soon as you tighten them with the Allen wrench, you've scratched it, you wash the bike, that's nothing but a rust hole. It looks terrible. The chrome falls off, the stuff doesn't work, the O-rings leak, the brakes don't work. It's junk. So the custom bike I had built had a, I bought a brand new Evo 80 inch motor, put an SNS cab on it. Uh, I forget whose ignition system I had, but all that stuff ran great. I put a four speed kickstart tranny in it because I built a FX style bike, which has external shocks. I built a factory four speed FX from the seventies, much like my brother had bought brand new. I sold that bike because again, we're in the height of the custom bike craze. And it was 2001 at this point. And I had read, uh, the internet had just got going so you could learn more. When I bought my first two bikes and built mine, I didn't have internet. So I knew the 2001 and up twin cam soft tails had a balance shaft in the engine. The engine's still solid mounted, but the engine's balanced. So you can actually ride with your other buddies who may have more comfortable bikes and you're not beating the heck out of yourself. Boy, my custom bike, by the time you rode all afternoon, you were beat up. Everybody else isn't even out of breath yet. So with that soft tail, that was a great bike. It was a soft tail standard 2001, still carbureted, but I loved that bike. But when I bought it, my wife at the time didn't want a touring bike, which is what I wanted. She didn't want an old man's bike. Now the whole world wants the touring bike. So when she left. I went right to the dealer, traded in that soft tail standard, and bought a 2004 Road Glide. Heated hand grips, cruise control, stereo. I actually had them put uh, Holly aftermarket muffles on it and retune it, and that thing was perfect. The five speed that it still had, you just couldn't get it in fifth gear fast enough, and up to 70, 75, that's all you needed. Holly decided. I got a sidebar on transmissions for a minute, that in 2007, I think every model got the six speed. And that's when I stopped design. I don't want to own one newer than 2006. Again, because I eventually sold the Road Glide and a few years later bought, because it was a wicked deal, a 2007 soft tail standard custom with the 200 tire it was a cool bike but i went from cruise control and a radio and all that stuff to you out in the breeze and it was a wicked cool bike and only had 86 miles on it when i bought it it has the six speed holly just spread the ratios out the one through five in the five speeds for years was perfect all it needed was an overdrive like baker drivetrain did they sell a five speed with overdrive so a six speed with over, they also sell a straight six speed, but Holly went with a straight six speed. They spread the ratios out. Six gear is still one to one, but it's useless below 65 miles an hour. The bike just sits there and chugs. The compensator in the primary is just chugging the whole time. It's gross. So you ride around in fifth gear, which isn't one to one. That's not efficient. That's not smart. I don't want anything to do with that. I know Baker Drivetrain did sell a different uh, primary sprocket to help match the Holly transmission to what they did with this straight six speed, which might make it better. But all they needed to do was put an overdrive on the five speed if you felt you needed to cruise at 75 plus miles an hour out in the desert. Where I live, I don't need the overdrive. A five speed is perfect. Look at that, I've talked it again. Hang on. And we're back. I fixed it. I gotta stop talking so much. This video is already longer than I expected. So my last bike was the Softail Custom. 
and I sold it when I fell in love with an old Mopod that I never bought. So the bike is gone. I don't have a bike right now. And it just so happens I started, maybe I saw it on a marketplace and clicked on it. And what I learned was, well, new bikes are ridiculous. I don't want anything like that anyway. I want like an 01 or 99 to 06. So it's fuel injected, five speed, probably a touring bike, but I'd, I'd consider a soft tail, even a heritage, which is a cross between, you know, it looks like a touring bike, but it's still a soft tail frame. But ultimately the touring bike, the bagger, as they call them, is where it's at. Man, used prices are down right now. Now most of your touring bikes will have 30 to 50,000 miles. If you shop around, you can find one with less than that. Most of them have over 100,000 miles. I saw one with 350,000 miles on it. I told the guy that belongs in a museum. I've heard like Holly buying them back with a half a million on them just to see how they made it that far. So I believe they'll go the distance. It's nothing to worry about. So you're looking at a 20 to 30,000 mile touring bike of the year, you know, early 2000s up to 2006. You know, I see I've saved 150 something on my Facebook Marketplace save feature. In the last week, I've saved 150 of them, like I said, all less than 5,000 bucks or right around 5,000 bucks. So that's a long ways from the mid 90s where any big twin, which is what every Holly is not a sportster is called. You know, that's hard to believe. But new, forget it. I mean, they're $30,000, $40,000. <laughs> and all the aftermarket bikes, if anybody, if any of the companies are still going, which I have not done any research, it's surprising if they are. You know, they were all based on rigid mount Evo type engines. And they're all built out of aftermarket. Some, some companies were better than others, but most of those are worthless. I mean, people try to get some of their money back for them because they were really expensive at the time. A few years ago, well, I guess technically the last bike I owned was a big dog. I think it was, had a 113 inch motor, the Baker six speed with head overdrive. It was pretty rough. I had traded, hmm, what did I trade? Oh, an old Chevy body that I had, 33 Chevy, 31, two, three Chevy. I traded even for that bike and I traded that bike for the international pickup that I had for a while. So it was just trading bait is all it was. I didn't keep it and fix it up. And I don't know if I even need a bike right now, to be honest with you. I don't go anywhere to speak of. And if I do, I'm usually on a purpose. Like I need a truck or my car or I'm taking somebody with me. So and while I'm shopping for one, I don't know if I'll buy one or not. Even though the prices are down, it's getting closer to winter time, it probably only get cheaper. But if you're looking for a used bike right now, man, there's some deals out there because I don't know anybody that even rides in groups anymore. It used to be fun. You get together with your buddies. Eventually it became what I joked is instead of the expression ride to live, live to ride, it was ride to eat, eat to ride because all you do is ride to a restaurant and spend all afternoon arguing over who was going to pay for what on the check. <laughs> but it was still good times. Riding in a group is you know, a challenge sometimes, but it's also fun. Uh, I learned I don't like being the lead. If I'm gonna ride in a group, I don't mind just being in the back and you can just kind of follow. As long as you don't run into the bike in front of you, you're doing all right. And you can shut your brain off and it's somewhat safer because man, as you know with cell phones and stuff, it's not safe out there. So I've never been down on a motorcycle, but I had one crash. I hit a deer at 65 with my wife on the back, Memorial Day weekend, I forget the year, right around 2010. And I just realized talking right now, my wife hasn't ridden since. And it wasn't traumatic that she didn't want to, it just never happened by the time I fixed the bike. I pulled the fender off the tire. I'm going 65 in the dark, the thing steps out in front of my, in front of my headlight. Now, I'm riding my road glide, the full fairing, I'm with two people on the back, I'm 11, 1200 pounds of bike. How they even felt the deer when I went over. I aimed for the middle of it, I had no choice. I don't remember touching the brake. The next day, the skid mark was 80 feet long with the rear brake, because I was trained to always skid with the rear, of course, don't grab the front. 
everything that should have happened with probably some assistance from above, I skid. I hit the thing right in the middle. I went over it. I remember the hooves hit my leg and scratched my saddlebag a little bit. It pushed the fender in on the tire. And I coasted up under a street light, the only street light for miles. The guy behind me pulls up in the car and says, you know you just hit a deer? I said, well, I got a pretty good idea. So I walked back to look for it. And then by then I'd already called the police because you don't, if you don't have an accident report, you can't do anything with insurance. So long story short, I pulled the fender off the tire the next day. We were going on a group ride, which I went on by myself because it was during a work, it was a work event. And uh, I bought uh, the local stealership, uh, which I'm not super fond of, but every one Saturday a month, they'd have like a 20% off sale. So I bought a painted fender to match my bike. And I basically bolted it on there and that was good to go. No other damage. The fairing had moved around, but I put it, I had it off before, you know, the big road glide fairing, put it all back together, no damage. And you'd never know that bike would ever, ever hit anything. So, but two years before this accident, uh, I realized, you know, I developed somewhat of a bald spot. If I'm going to cover my head with something, why wouldn't I cover it with a helmet? Now, my state in Maine, you don't have to wear a helmet. I chose to start wearing it two years before I hit the deer. And then if my, my justification for having a bike all this time was to drive, ride it to work. I had to be to work by 6 a.m. So even on the hottest of days in the summer, when you're riding at 5.15 in the morning to get to work by 6, it's cold out. So if you don't have saddlebags and stuff to put your gear in, if you don't want to ride, wear it on the way home, you got to wear it on the way home as well. So I just got trained, even though whether I had bags or not, I wore all my gear all the time. I was dressed to hit the ground. And fortunately, I never have. I came close. And I've been in other scrapes where you know, cars pull out in front of you and all kinds of stuff. But I thank, I'm thankful for I had, you know, lots of mini bike and off-road bike training and jumping bikes. And I was prepared. I knew what everything felt like pretty much. Although, you know, with the touring bike, it's a lot heavier. But man, I felt like I had the advantage when I was about to hit that deer. So it was a good size doe, good size. That's why I went back to see if I could, you know, maybe keep it, but it, it had, uh, I didn't find it. So, but anyway, that's my story. So if I, you see me riding today, I'm gonna have all my gear on, not because somebody told me I had to, because I told myself I had to. So thanks for listening and I'll uh, catch you next time.